Good evening, I'm Bill Luxton. The human eye has been described as the window of the soul. Tonight, the eye of the camera is the key to a fascinating experiment in thought perception. And now welcome to the amazing world of Kreskin. Funny thing is, you know, I'm standing backstage before we're going on the air, and there's always, there's always a great deal of excitement before a show starts. You wonder if it's really going to happen. And suddenly I hear this tremendous noise, and my studio director collapsed and bumped his knee on some object. He got the impression I was sending. <laughs> Folks, at this moment, I'd like to try to perceive some impressions that you're sending, or at least projecting to me. And because I don't know you folks and uh, have not been introduced to any of you, I really don't know where you'd be located, so do me a favor. Concentrate on anything that is, is of significance to you. And if I perceive it, just stand and acknowledge it. Now, as I talk to you, well, it seems to me that some, someone here in the audience is concentrating. Would it be on... Well, I'm jotting down June 16th. I don't... I suspect it's a birth date. If I'm wrong, then maybe you can acknowledge it. Does that ring a bell in someone's mind? Am I close? Was anyone here born in the month of June? <laughs> no? Uh, no, that don't, don't help me in that way. I usually get about one out of every 12 hits on that particular area of the test. Would the person be thinking of May uh, 16th? I, I keep getting 16, which is why I, I'm writing it down as I talk to you. Anybody here in the house? Nobody here in the audience? No one has, would have... Let me stop for a moment. I don't think I'm guessing. It is a date a person has in mind. The person is thinking of their birth date. It was some time ago, and it's, it's the month of March. It is 16. Who's been concentrating on March 16th, please? Lady right there. Ma'am, uh, may I ask you this? Uh, have we ever met before? No, never. I got very confused because in my mind's eye, as I think of, ter of M.A., my reasoning entered into it, and I immediately thought of May. Were you born? You mind if I go for the year? Is it all right with you yes. if I try? All right, just concentrate. Don't say it. You're a generous ma uh, woman to say that. Allow me to. Were you born on in 1917? That's correct. Thank you very much for standing. I appreciate it. Who has in mind? I, the numbers make no meaning to me. Four, uh, four, two, one. As the beginning of some digits, does that ring a bell in someone's mind here? Four, two, one, three. Then I get a nine. Does that ring a bell? Anyone? Stand if it does, please. Good for my next miracle. <laughs> was anyone thinking of Nevada here in the audience? Nobody was. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, sooner or later, I, I suppose something like this would take place. All I can help ask is that you help me harness your thinking if you hold, are holding a social security card or something along that line, kind of concentrate on it. And maybe I can zero in. Who was thinking of Florida? Anyone here in the audience? Would you kindly concentrate? Would you stand? Does anyone have Florida in mind? Does it ring a bell? No one here? Not a living soul. All right. Please stand. Uh, may I ask you this, sir? Have you been to Florida or are you from Florida? I've been there. How, how long ago were you there? Uh, about eight months. What is your name, please, sir? Steve. Steve, who is Jerry? <laughs> I ask you who Jerry is? It's her baby. Her, her son. baby. Your baby, uh, you've named it Jerry. Obviously, it's a boy, am I correct? That's remarkable perception on, on my part. <laughs> Madam, would you stand for a moment? Would your boy be more than a year old, yes or no? Yes. Don't tell me how old. Well, was, you're thinking of the year he was born. Was it 1967? Yes. He was born in 1967. <laughs> I can't get the month of the day. I believe, though, now you've given it to me mentally, it was November? November 12th? Right. Thank you very, very much. I've just got to ask, I get, it doesn't make sense to me. I see G-A-L, 
wonder if it's a foreign word or something. G-A-L-I-R-U or something like that. Am I close? Does it ring a bell in anyone's mind? No, I'm getting, I think, uh, thoughts that I'm reasoning. Who's thinking Jason, please? Would you kindly stand? Anybody here in the audience? Anyone have Jason in mind? J-A-S-O-N. Would you stand, please, ma'am? May I ask you this? Who is Jason, please? Oh, it's just a guy's name I like. A guy's name that you like? Is he here with you? No, he's not. Well, we'll bear off on, on Jason. Let's, I, I just remain standing, though. Were you thinking in terms of your birth date? June 13th. Oh, don't tell. Did you just tell it to me? Well, she said it, and then obviously there's no... What does May 11th mean to you? That's this guy's birthday. This fellow's birthday. Not your own, but this fellow. Do you happen to know the year he was born? Yes or Just say yes or no. Yes. Don't tell me. And I've never met you before, have I? No. Was he born in 1956? Yes. By the way, uh, his name is what? Steve. Uh, who was Jerry then? Jason. Jason. Who was Jason? You just said Steve. I thought, who was Jason? No, Jason is uh, the name I was thinking of before. Uh, the name you and Steve is who to you? <laughs> She's a busy girl, I want to tell you. Do you have someone in mind or uh, uh, something beginning with N? Do you have a pet of some kind? Or yes. N-A-T? Is it a pet or what? Or a friend? That's another name. Another, uh, a boyfriend? No. A girlfriend? Yeah, just a friend. Just a friend. N-A-T, I was thinking of Natalie. That's not quite right, is it? No. Say, don't tell me. Oh, I can't get it. Uh, uh, uh. I can't get it. Natasha! Right. <laughs> By the way, before you sit down, miss, what does the month of June and the day of the 13th mean to you? My birthday. <laughs> it's your birthday. Thank you very, very much. We'll be back in a little while, folks, for an interesting problem involving a handkerchief, a ring, and a coin in just a few seconds. Thank you. Yes, I what do. kind of job do you have there? Uh, it's like a clerk. I help file prescriptions. And, yeah. Do they? Uh, no one's looking in. Is there ever an error made in prescriptions? Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> we'll go on from there. Now that it's recorded for a posterity, <laughs> I have an effect. I just uh, a few weeks ago appeared in in Rome, Italy. It was one of the joys of my life. In fact, I not only performed in Rome, but uh, appeared at the Isle of Capri, which is as close to paradise as maybe I'll have a chance to. Have you ever been there? No, I wish I were. You must go someday. <laughs> but in the lobby, a lot of people from around the States recognize me in Canada and uh, England and so forth. And I did something, not an ESP, but I asked for a few few things. Some of you were concentrating on objects in your hand, which I don't, they don't show me, but you, you had a coin, which we borrowed from down farther to pass it across, and uh, it's a fair-sized coin. Hold on. We have a handkerchief here. Where's the handkerchief? Thank you, sir. And then we had a ring. A ring? Yeah. Ring is right there. Good, hold on to it just for a moment, sir. What I'm going to do, let me have the coin. I'll take the coin thusly, and I'm going to cover it over the handkerchief. Now, I'm not going to make it disappear. It's nothing like that. I think you'll realize that the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the coin is there. You can feel it. Want to touch it? Isn't it amazing that it is a coin, exactly as I've said? <laughs> now, what I'm going to do, take the ring, if you will, and maybe you can help me. Place the ends of, we'll, we'll twist this around actually, because the only way to prevent the coin from coming out is to put the ends through the ring. Put each of the ends through the ring and just file them through like that. Now, up till now, we could still get the coin. Corn, you can pull them in one at a time, it might be easier to pull them through. And we still, before you go any further, we could still exit the, the ring, the, the coin, through the opening of the handkerchief here. So pull further. I want to lock the coin inside the handkerchief and the only way you can do it is by bringing it all the way down which i think you're locking it literally all the way down to the coin and the coin obviously is much larger than the ring so it is locked in there if you want to try this later it is a perfect way of literally locking a coin now hold each corner both of you one corner in each hand hold the handkerchief open if you will if you'll do me that favor fine in fact hold the corners taut if you will not too tight not too tight we can see, in fact, loosen, uh, hold on, but bring it in a little bit closer. You can see the coin through there, and of course, if you'll relax a little bit, you uh, relax your, bring your hands closer, you can see the shape of the ring. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Now, 
I cannot see a monitor, but what I'm going to do is this, and I'm not sure we can do it the way I propose to. When I count to three, I want you to pull, to literally pull on the handkerchief. You may rip the ring, not the ring, but the cloth of the hanky, or something else may happen. One, two, three. The coin, hold on to the ends, has come right through, and if my, floor, uh, my gentleman here, Steve, will grab it, the ring actually fell right out the bottom, literally the coin through the ring, and there's been no damage done to the handkerchief in any way. That, my friend, is the Very few seconds, folks. We will be back with a really special guest. Thank you. It's time to welcome tonight's special guest, an actor of great versatility, equally at home singing in a supper club, acting on the Broadway stage, or writing in a Western series. Would you welcome, please, Mr. Robert Horton? That's who it is. Great audience, my friend. Go on, get on with me. I told you you'd recognize her immediately. Come on over here. Yeah, right over here, my friend. You set that interesting object there for later on. Of course, I, I, I heard them say, but not only uh, the Western series Wagon Train, which was how long? How many years was that? Long? Well, I was on it for five years. It went for two more after I left it. Did you work with, you didn't work with Ward Bond, did you? Oh, I worked very hard with Ward Bond. <laughs> I wasn't even going to ask you this, but what type of person? Was he a quiet man, an outgoing person? No, I think Ward Bond was very much the way he appeared on the screen, especially in the role of Wagon Train. He's a, he's a big, husky, uh, burly fellow. Mm. But then some, I listened to Bill Luxton mention your singing career, and you traveled around the world. Well, I got very interested in that. When I was doing Wagon Train, I knew that I wasn't going to spend the rest of my life saying they went that away, and so I really got interested in the, in the musical theater, and I guess I spent most of the last ten years doing that. In fact, I just finished a fabulous production. I, would, I really say this because it, every now and then you have the opportunity of working in a show that, um, where everything so comes together that it's an enormous privilege and, and pleasure for you to have been associated with it, and I just was associated with a production of 1776 oh. at the uh, Paper Mill Playhouse in New Jersey. That's, I think, the finest production I've ever been in, and it was really a delight to be a part of it. Forty minutes from where I live, actually. Really terrific. I, I gotta ask you, because I, I've never talked to anybody that it happened to, but I know one day Ralph Edwards walked out oh, yeah, and said, this is your life. Let us know, how does it feel? Did you have any inkling? Robert? None whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I, I had just been married um, Oh, I think about 18 days when that mm, happened. What a time and to have someone say, this is your well, life. The thing that was amazing about it is that uh, <clears throat> my wife suddenly, we were married, and then suddenly she had the burden of keeping this from me, right? And all of a sudden I said to her one day, you've become a compulsive talker. What is the matter with you? Because she was so afraid. Anytime anything happened, she was afraid that, you know how people... Oh, yes. If you when hide you have something... a secret, you feel that somebody knows what it's going to be. Yeah. And uh, the particular evening that uh, Mr. Edwards came to call on me, well, uh, we had a house guest, and I was late coming home from the studio, and I wondered why, when the doorbell rang, I said to Marilyn, I said, would you answer the doorbell? And she said, I can. And I said, well, what about Anne? Why doesn't Anne answer the doorbell? She said, she can't. She's got her hair in curlers, and she has a date. And I was going downstairs swearing, thinking, wow, there's two ladies in this house. are crying out loud. Why won't they open the door? And I got downstairs, and I opened the door. And, and just as I opened happened. the door, and I was putting my shirt tail in and mumbling, and as I opened the door, I suddenly became aware of all these lights that were, out, that were outside. And my first impression was that there was a fire because, <laughs> the, because of the nature of the lights. And, the, and I opened the door, and as I did, there was Ralph Edwards. And I said, you got to be out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Those were my first words. Yeah. Well, I was, we, there isn't much time, but I just wanted maybe very briefly, uh, something your wife was called by Goward Champion, uh, not a witch, but something close to spooky. becoming spooky. Uh, spooky because of uh, a whole little incident that was taken. I was involved with the production of On a Clear Day You Can See Forever, which, had to, which dealt with extrasensory Extra conception and precognition and all those things. And yeah. uh, one day in a meeting with, uh, with Gower, all of a sudden Marilyn said, you know, I had a dream last night where I dreamed that Irene Sheriff was going to do the costumes for the show and that the entire flashback sequences of the show were all going to be done in tans and browns, uh, like a uh, gravure section of a newspaper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and his wife, Mars Champion, and he said, 
That's spooky, because I had a meeting with Irene Sheriff the day before yesterday, and we came to the conclusion that's what we were going to do, and nobody knows about it but her and me. Do you find it difficult to keep secrets from your wife? I don't try. <laughs> I know you have a hobby of uh, flying. In fact, a good friend of mine is a pr uh, private flyer. Do you oh, still yes? pilot a plane from time to time? Oh, yes. I have a Comanche, which I've had for many years, and I fly all over the country. I, I enjoy the... It's a hobby, and it's a way of getting around, and it... It's, uh, it keeps me occupied. I and enjoy. antique cars. And then I know, of course, this is sitting here, obviously, <laughs> folks. Uh, Mr. Horton would not just walk on with a camera walking around. He didn't want to photograph the show. But he, is, he mentioned a secret earlier, and I know you've posed a, a secret for me. We're going to explain when we come back how you set this up, because he had to kind of do it in a spy-like fashion while I'm in my dressing room or other places. When did you get interested in photography? Ever professionally, Bob? Oh, no, I, no, I'm not a, in any way. I mean, photography is something when you're involved in the motion picture business, you become aware of a, of a moment in life or in time that is suddenly captured and how interesting it can be. And uh, every, I have a good eye for what I think is uh, attractive or a, a moment that is worth looking at. My problem is I don't really know enough about the f-stops. If I had someone to fix the camera, I said, that's the shot I want, I'd be in pretty good shape. I don't know what that is. In fact, I don't know what's in here, but I think we'll all find out in just a few seconds. I have got to ask, Bob, we were talking about cameras because I don't even know how to hold a camera. Usually people stand me up and the camera tilts. But, Bob, explain uh, what the staff had you do, unbeknownst to me. And I have to honestly tell you, this is unbeknownst to me because I did not see Bob do this. Uh, there were to be as few people around. What did you do before the program, Bob, with that camera? I was asked to go into the audience and at random pick somebody and take a photograph of them. Bob... When you photographed this person, uh, just let me ask this, was it in the studio here, was it in the hallway, and I know, or I know, I understand people are waiting often in a cafeteria here. It was the, in this building. It was in the building. It was in the building. Uh, where it was a whole audience watching you? No. No, good. That's, that's just interesting. Just one other person was watching. One other person. Now, obviously, this person knows the, who is the subject of this. I'm going to ask you, Bob, to hold the camera in your left hand. And what I propose to do is this. Obviously, I cannot perceive the thoughts of a, of a Polaroid film, but there is a person in this audience who is in Bob's mind and is further impressed in his mind because he looked at this person through a camera, saw the person. The evidence of whether I'm successful or not is going to be with the film. Not that Bob would say yes if I fail. I, we don't do that kind of a program. Now, Bob, in a moment, I'm going to lead you about this auditorium and I want you to concentrate on how I'm to get to the person in your mind only just speak mm -hmm. to me mentally mm -hmm. now I'm going to lead you as a matter of fact I'd like you to place your right hand at my wrist please if you will I'm going to lead you say nothing don't do anything but just concentrate as clearly as you can when I say begin all right ready say nothing concentrate begin as clearly as you can please you think of exactly where this person is Concentrate as clearly as you can. Literally, sh say nothing. I ask my audience to say nothing. If you will, please, just concentrate as clearly as you can. I'm going the wrong way. You must correct me mentally. As clearly as you can, please, if you will. I'm going to ask you to step out, uh, just step out here just for a moment, please, ma'am. Step over here. Keep concentrating as clearly as you can. Obviously, what I wish to do is to touch the person. You must concentrate if I'm, if I'm touching the wrong person. Just in your mind, as clearly as you can, please. Uh, would you come out here, please, ma'am? Very, very, you don't mind, do you? Step down here. It doesn't matter. I'm going to ask you to come out also, miss, if you will. Step over here. For some reason, I am obsessed not so much with an individual, but a, a position. If I end up by touching the camera, it would be wild. Touch it as clearly as you can, love. Literally think exactly. Stand right here. I'm going to ask you to stand, this lady right here to stand, please. Would you stand, please? And you stand right there. Bob, stay on my right now, if you will. If you let go of my hand, place your, your head on my shoulder, please, Bob. Now, I emptied this. Every time, don't help me in any way, every time I want to touch this person here, you say no, say nothing, just listen to my conversation. Now, I'm gonna, I want both of you to face me, please. I am absolutely certain that it is one of you, except that, of course, Bob saw you through a camera, a camera lens. 
There were no glasses. There were no glasses on the person you photographed, Bob. I believe this is the person. Am I correct? You are correct. It is the person. <laughs> to open, open that yes, Bob. And let's take it out in just a moment. Let's corroborate this, Bob, can we? Just wait a minute. We have to wait about a minute. And, Miss, uh, where were you while Bob is waiting? Because we only have a little <laughs> bit more time. Where were you when Bob photographed this? What part of the building? In the room. You were in a room, <laughs> not his dressing room, I pray to. I'm kidding, my, uh, but uh, it, what part of the building? In a, in a, in a uh, cafeteria or what? No, near the cafeteria. Near the cafeteria. Bob, I don't know how I... I guess we're giving, being given a countdown on one minute so that we can actually verify the fact. She has agreed that it was this herself as well, and this picture, I think, will just be the final corroboration. It's interesting that you had me climb over people, I thought, rather than do it. Ah, yes, my friend. Not only is your thinking strong and clear, but the accuracy of the shot, if we may show it right here, it is exactly the same person. Isn't that clear? We have that on camera? Exactly the same person. Bob, stay right here. Look at me just for a moment, please. I have never met you. Think of your last name. Just concentrate, please. I've never met you before, have I? No. We've never spoken before. Just think of how many letters. Five letters, yes or no? Five letters to your name, yes or no? Say it out loud. A, does that ring a bell? Yes. It sounds something like Arbor, am I correct? That's it. How do you pronounce it? Arbor. Arbor is correct. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Stay with us. You will. As a matter of fact, ladies and gentlemen, there's a very, very old theory about the mind, which suggests that the mind and thoughts were like a photographic plate, and the thoughts were light being picked up and shined on the photographic plate. This was the theory of the unconscious, that a thought impressed itself on the sensitized mechanism of the unconscious mind. It's interesting, but we still know very little about the power of the mind. See you next week, my friends, and goodbye, everybody. <laughs> so, how about coming down? And we're going to put you to While in Ottawa, Creston and his guests stay at the beautiful Skyline Hotel. Skyline also had hotels in Toronto, Montreal and Brockville, as well as Kingston, Jamaica and London, England.